If you've seen or read The Martian, you'll know that an integral part of the survival strategy of NASA astronaut Mark Watney revolves around his ability to grow food locally on Mars. It's only natural to wonder then as to how viable such an approach may be in practice. So in order to try and address this question, a group of ecologists at the Netherlands Wageningen University, supported by Mars One, have been conducting a series of experiments over the past three years, attempting to grow plants in a Martian soil simulant. This research program, headed by Dr. Vega Varmelink, has been yielding some impressive results lately, so I wanted to give you a summary of their progress to date. In the first phase of these experiments in 2013, 14 plant species, including the crops tomato, rye, carrot and cress, were cultivated across 840 individual pots using three different types of soil. A Mars regolith simulant and a Moon regolith simulant manufactured by NASA, in addition to a control sample of nutrient-poor deep river soil to compare to how plants would grow on the Earth. The simulant that was used in the case of Mars and the Moon is actually sourced from volcanic soil that comes originally from Hawaii, which is thought to be similar in its bulk composition to what you would see on Mars or the Moon. The conditions used in these experiments were roughly Earth-like, to simulate what you would see in, say, a greenhouse on the surface of Mars in a Martian colony. So that means 20 degrees Celsius overall maintained throughout the 50-day growing period, as well as Earth-like atmospheric composition. So as to the results, in general, the plants growing in the lunar simulant did terribly, many of them died, a few of them did actually manage to germinate, and I believe at least one species actually showed flowering, but it was just terrible compared to the Earth samples. But really interestingly, and very surprisingly actually for the researchers, the plants growing in the Martian soil simulant, in many of the categories being measured, actually outperformed the Earth control. If you'd like to actually look at the results yourself and delve maybe into some of the technical literature, the results were actually published in 2014 in the scientific journal PLOS One, and I'll link to that down below for you. Having demonstrated that plants can indeed grow in a Martian soil simulant, in 2015, Vega's team turned their focus towards growing 10 potentially edible crops. This time though, they mixed inedible parts of the 2013 plants into the soil in order to provide a source of organic material in order to provide nutrients to help the plants grow. This time around, all of the crops germinated within just 10 days, and indeed after a few months, radish, pea and tomato had grown. A natural next step for the research that they've been focusing on this year was to assess whether the crops grown are actually consumable by humans. So this means addressing the safety of the food. And in particular, the main concern of the researchers was examining heavy metal take-up by the plants. So the basic issue here is that if you have, say, in the Martian soil simulant, heavy metals such as arsenic, cadmium, mercury or lead, for example, the plants can take them up via their roots, and if the concentration of these heavy metals in the plants becomes too high, then effectively it means that anyone who tries to eat them can become poisoned by these large concentrations. In addition to the safety aspects that were being addressed in their experiments this year, they also modified the crops being grown slightly to include species such as green beans and, in the spirit of the Martian, potatoes. The first results from this heavy metal study were announced at the Mars One VIP event in Amsterdam in early June. The key takeaway is that of the four crops tested so far for heavy metals, which were radishes, peas, rye and tomato, by checking for the heavy metals aluminium, copper, iron, manganese, zinc, arsenic, cadmium, chrome, nickel and lead, all of the levels of these heavy metals were found to be below the limit at which they are safe for human consumption. And indeed, some of the concentrations were found to be lower even than in the Earth soil. 
Crops grown on Mars do indeed potentially seem to be edible, which is a fantastic result. But they've still obviously got a long way to go with their research, but this is extremely encouraging. If you'd like to actually watch Dr. Farmerlink's presentation from the VIP event, I'll post that just over there also. And I'll also put over there a Q&A video where he answers some questions about his current research. Since this announcement, a first tasting of the radish harvest took place at the end of June, with Dr. Varmalink describing the taste as good and spicy. And more recently, the first potatoes grown in a Martian soil simulant were harvested in late July. The question now then is whether the six remaining crops, including the potatoes, are safe for consumption. And to this end, the researchers have set up a crowdfunding campaign seeking €25,000 in order to continue their heavy metal testing. They've already raised over half of this amount, with the campaign due to conclude around the end of August. In particular, what I would like to note is one of the very interesting pledge rewards, which is that for people pledging above a certain amount, they receive an invitation to attend a dinner at Wageningen University, where a chef will professionally prepare a four-course meal using all of the different crops grown in this experiment found to be safe for human consumption. And yes, that does include the first potatoes grown in a Martian soil simulant. So who knows? Do you want the chance in order to see what Mark Watney had the wonder of tasting for so long? I know, take a look at the campaign if you're interested. I'll post a link to that down below. And if you do have any questions for Dr. Varmalink, there is a Food for Mars community on Facebook where he regularly posts updates and also replies to pretty much every question that people post on there. So I'll also link to that down below. Definitely check it out. The Food for Mars experiments are one example of how Mars One endeavours to keep the public informed of exciting new developments that could potentially enable human life on Mars one day. They often discuss these developments in blog posts on their Mars Exchange blog. Most recently, an interview with Professor John Rummel, a member of COSPAR's panel of planetary protection has been featured, which includes questions such as how planetary protection principles apply to Mars One, the issue of forwards and backwards contamination, and also the potential implications of how a discovery of Martian life prior to the first humans landing on Mars could affect future human missions. You'll also find some new recent articles from Mars One's Chief Technical Officer, Arno Wilders, where he discusses mission costs, relevant technologies, as well as how Mars One's initial budget of $6 billion, or at least their initial estimated budget, was formulated. And finally, there is a new post which includes the eight videos in the Mars 100 video profile series released so far, including a new video featuring American candidate Cassandra Morphy. Now, as to what the candidates have been up to lately, we've been busy formulating our groups for the upcoming team challenges in the third round of Mars One selection process. At this point in time, 89 of the 100 candidates have found tentative group positions, with 3 of 10 groups being completed. Though there is a degree of flexibility to move between various positions in the groups up until the challenges actually commence, but once they commence, then the teams are locked into place. I do note though that at the beginning of this process, two candidates chose to withdraw from Mars One's selection process. Italy's Pietro and South Africa's Cobus. They have since been replaced with two new German candidates, Wolfgang and Ludwig, who have come from a replacement list that was drawn up at the end of the second round of Mars One selection process. Part of facilitating this group formation process that we're going through at the moment is endeavouring to meet as many candidates as possible. Now, due to the practicalities of us being scattered all over the world, most often this takes place online, but wherever possible, we do try and meet in person. 
Since my last update, there have been Canadic meetups in Belgium and on both coasts of the United States, including one that I had the fortune to attend in Santa Cruz, where I was conducting research modelling water clouds on exoplanets. In other Canadian news, education and outreach with the public, and particularly in schools, has remained a strong theme, with talks given by American candidate Yari, Spanish candidate Angel, British candidate Claire, Australian candidate Diane, and South African candidate Adriana, just to name a few. Alongside this, Canadian candidate Andrea is amongst 3,300 people applying to join the Canadian Space Agency's astronaut program. And also, American candidate Hampton has just started working as a mechanical design engineer for the private space company Moon Express, which just a few days ago announced that they have received regulatory approval from the United States Federal Aviation Authority to attempt to become the first private company to land on the moon in late 2017. Exciting times indeed. I'll leave you with one final collection of thoughts from Matt Damon himself, who was recently asked to share his advice for Australian Mars One candidate Natalie. You can check out what he has to say down in the description. Thanks for watching. If you're new to this channel, I produce monthly updates on the Mars One project on the first Saturday of each month, as well as explorations in planetary science, astrophysics, and human spaceflight. This month's feature video is a concise but deep outline from SpaceX CEO Elon Musk on why he sees going to Mars as a priority. Now as to how SpaceX plans to send large numbers of people to Mars, I'll be examining that next week in a video on the so-called Mars Colonial Transporter.